Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. More often than not, if you want something that is good, you're going to have to wait for it. For example, regardless of how much you actually like Thanksgiving turkey, you're all better off that it was baked in an oven for a few hours because do you think it would have tasted any better if it would have just been tossed in the microwave for half an hour, especially if it would not have been thawed? Or if you're into video games, you probably shouldn't take whatever money you have in your pocket right now and go buy at a pawn shop a Nintendo GameCube or a <coughs> PlayStation 1 because you should just wait for a few weeks to see what kind of money you get for Christmas. And then, if you have enough, go out and buy a PlayStation 4 or whatever Xbox number we're on now. <laughs> it's not like the GameCube wasn't fun. It's what I played when I was younger. It's just that you'll see that there are better offerings out there today. It is very often in our best interest to wait. But very rarely is waiting what we want to do. Waiting is hard. It doesn't give us what we want and then let us have fun with it right now. Sometimes, though, waiting is necessary. Either that which we want isn't ready yet, or we and all those waiting with us aren't yet ready to receive that which we want. This was true of all those who hungrily awaited Thanksgiving dinner this past Thursday, and it was true of all those who, in Old Testament times, waited for God to keep his long-made and oft-repeated promise to send his Christ, the Messiah, into our world. It would have been hard, hard at times for our ancestors, ancestors in the faith to perceive that God was ever going to keep his promise. It would have been especially hard, in particular, at times like during the Babylonian captivity, to see that God was remaining faithful to the promise and those to whom he had made it. But just as we, in times of difficulty and sadness, have to walk by faith and not by sight, so also God's people in the centuries leading up to Christ's incarnation and birth had to wait for God to keep his promise, not by what they could see, but according to what they believed. God waited until he was ready to send Jesus into the world. And God also waited until we were ready, which means until the time that the world situation was conducive to the manifestation of the gospel promise. This fullness of time came about while God's people were under the rule of the Roman Empire. But they were not just under Roman rule. God's people and all those under Roman rule were also able to travel on safe, reliable Roman roads. And they, and they wrote and spoke in the common Roman tongue of the, Green, of the Greek language. In these and other ways, the world was finally ready for God to keep his promise because the saving word of that promise would not be culturally and linguistically bottled up in Israel, but it would be free to move throughout the whole Roman Empire pretty quickly and then from there throughout the rest of the world. Even though those who lamented the expansion of Roman rule and its pagan culture could not have seen at that time how this expansion could possibly be a good thing it was, because God had made it so. God worked through certain aspects of Roman rule and Roman civic advancements to make it a good thing. God was about to keep his promise, the promise which we'll now hear again as he repeated it through Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 18. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The prophet Jeremiah lived and worked about 600 years before the time of Christ. If we had been alive in Israel back then, 
we would have thought that this was a great time for God to keep his promise and deliver his people. Along with promise, prophesying of the Messiah, Jeremiah also told people that Jerusalem was about to fall before it actually did at the hands of the Babylonians. For saying this, or really for God saying this through his servant Jeremiah, Jeremiah was imprisoned and nearly killed because the king and those who served him did not like what Jeremiah was saying. Instead, they wanted to hear good news. They wanted God to keep his promise. In this, we are no different than them. When we receive a promise from anyone, man or God, we want it kept according to our schedule. We here, living today, 2,000 years after Jesus' incarnation and birth, are not waiting for God to keep his promise to send us our Savior. He's already come. God has told us so. We don't know this on the basis of our having seen Jesus with our own two eyes, but rather, by the work of the Holy Spirit through God's word, we believe that Jesus has already come and accomplished that for which he came. So we're not waiting for Jesus to come for the first time. Instead, we're waiting for Jesus to come back. In this, we are subject to the same temptations as God's people who waited for Jesus to come for the first time. When is Jesus going to come? I need God's help right now. Why isn't God listening to me? Maybe Jesus isn't going to come back. We cannot see, on our own, God's long-term will for us individually or for the human race. We are only able to perceive that which we can feel and sense and what our bodies and even our sinful natures urge us and tell us to do. So really, the way in which we are all sinfully inclined to consider God and his faithfulness is according to the standard of what have you done for me lately? According to this way of thinking, who cares that God the Father miraculously caused the divine word to become flesh and that this one then suffered and died to pay for our sins. That happened a long time ago. What have you done for me lately? God, though, is not a bellhop. His loving care is not offered to us in the same way that we would order room service at a hotel, ordering what we want and saying when we want to get it. This is true of the ways in which God cares for us and our bodies and souls right now. And it's true of the singular way in which God has seen to the present and eternal needs of all people. When it comes to everything, God knows better than we do, simply because he is God. Now to trust in this, in God's perfect knowledge and sense of timing, we do not have to just instill in ourselves a better sense of trust. We can rely on God for this trust and how he has throughout history kept those promises which he has made. God has not yet kept all of his promises, but as Jeremiah writes, God has kept the messianic promise which he made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He has kept this same promise which he made to King David as we have it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. That after David died, God would raise up one from among his descendants and establish this one as the ruler of an eternal kingdom. Jeremiah continues that in those coming days, which for us have now come and gone, the one whom God would raise up would execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now in Christ, God has kept this promise because for the whole of Jesus' life, he was never anything less than completely just and righteous in what he did and what he said. And Jeremiah continues, in those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will be made to dwell securely. Now these last two promises were not kept by God in the ways that Jesus was actively obedient to God's law in his righteous life. These promises of security and salvation were kept by Jesus through the ways in which he was in his life passively obedient to God's will and what God has promised. Jesus was passively obedient to God and what God has promised by willingly bearing the full punishment for our sins in the physical and emotional suffering that he endured on his way to and then on the cross. 
So for us, when we trust in Jesus and his righteousness and in in his innocent death in our place, we and all God's people from all times are saved. We are secure and made safe, not because of anything about ourselves, but because of God's full and free forgiveness, which was earned by our Savior and what he did and endured. So because of all this, as Jeremiah writes, Jesus is not merely his own righteousness, but by God's gift of faith in Jesus as our Savior, we can say joyfully, Jesus is our righteousness. And then, when Jesus had saved us, and made us secure before God, he fulfilled the final promise that God gives to us through Jeremiah in these verses. Jesus did not stay here on earth, continuing to live as he had for the whole of his life. Jesus left. He departed from this world to the right hand of God the Father, where, as St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, he is constantly interceding for us. In general, interceding is what the Levitical priests did during Old Testament times. Now specifically, in interceding for us, what the priests did was to burn the grain and animal offerings that the people brought to the temple. These offerings couldn't ever stop. They had to always be made because just some grain or even a perfect animal couldn't actually pay for a sin. These offerings were a picture of Jesus and what he would accomplish And they pointed to the time when offerings like them would no longer have to be made. As Jesus now intercedes for us before God, he is our eternal, Levitical, if you will, high priest. And as Jesus reminds God of his own suffering and death on the cross, Jesus is also the great and final sacrifice. So because Jesus is at God's right hand, interceding for us, We know he was doing so both for our benefit and also as the way that God has kept this promise that there will always be one before him for us. Now you may be wondering why we're talking about all this. Because grown up Jesus is great, but this is Advent when we focus on little baby Jesus. We in these times of the Messiah who has now come are blessed to have the full picture of God's salvation. As we prepare to celebrate Christ's birth, we don't have to wonder what is going to happen next. We know that the little, seemingly helpless baby born of Mary grew up and then defeated the devil and death itself. It's all connected. If in Advent we were only preparing to celebrate the birth of a normal baby, then we wouldn't make much of a fuss at all. We would maybe throw the mother a baby shower, like the ladies did for my wife, but we wouldn't go to the trouble of changing the color of the pyramids and the banners in the sanctuary or having extra services on Wednesday nights. But Jesus was not a normal baby, even though he did come into our world in a run-of-the-mill, even abnormally humble way. In Christ, God caused to be born the fulfillment of every messianic salvific promise which he had ever made. Still, though, not every promise has yet to be fulfilled in Christ. Jesus left, but before he left, he said he would return. So we find ourselves waiting, like those who in the Old Testament waited for Jesus to come for the first time. And just as those who awaited the birth of their Messiah needed God to make them able to keep on waiting and believing in his promise of the Messiah, so also we in these times need God to be actively involved in helping us. To keep us from wondering what will or has happened, God has given us his inspired word. Through the prophets and evangelists and apostles, God tells us with his full divine authority both what he has already made happen and what he is going to make happen. And as we confront the temptations of life in this fallen world, and have to face up to the fact that we are still weak, sinful individuals, God does not want us to think that we are somehow diminished in our salvation and security before him. That is why in the gospel and in the proclamation of pastors and fellow Christians, 
God continues to forgive us our sins for Christ's sake. And finally, as we await for Jesus' return in the flesh as he left, God gives us a taste of the one we're waiting for. In the Lord's Supper, God gives us the true body and blood of our Savior under the bread and wine by which God makes us able to wait for Jesus by confirming in us the forgiveness Jesus has won. The day is coming when the one born of Mary will return as God promised and, as a result, bring an end to our waiting. God has shown us this will happen, not just by telling us, but also by keeping all of his promises up to this point. In the meantime, though, we will wait. And for the rest of Advent, we'll prepare to celebrate our Lord's birth. This waiting, not just now but in the future, might not always be fun and it won't always be easy. But God will give us the strength of patience we need to keep waiting for and believing that which he has promised. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.